Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks for the tremendous turnout on, on a Wednesday, not our normal Thursday. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce Ben Hayes, um, Professor Ben Hayes, who's um, a lecturer at Wits University. He's going to talk today on the on the Macondo Large Igneous Pro Amcondo Large Igneous Province. By way of background, Ben completed a PhD in igneous petrology, geochemistry, <clears throat> and economic geology on the Franklin Large Igneous Province in the Canadian Arctic. Um, the project was undertaken in collaboration with with the GEM project, um, Geological Survey, which is part of the Geological Sur Survey of Canada and involved four months of field work in, in the Arctic. Um, he has been a lecturer at the University of Nevada's run since March 2021, with a focus on igneous petrology, um, geochemistry, and economic geology. So over to you, Ben, and we look forward to your presentation and then the subsequent discussion. Thanks very much. Cool. Thanks very much, John, for the introduction and the invitation to give this talk. It's a nice program of talks, and it's a pleasure to be part of it. Uh, just to mention as well, I did my undergraduate at Durham University and Gillian was my uh, lecturer in geophysics in my second year. So just to add that to my um, to my CV just now. Um, so today I'm, I want to talk about the uh, mantle sources and geochemical evolution of the Mkondo Large Igneous Province in Southern Africa. This is probably the lesser known um, lip in Southern Africa. Plenty of work has been done on the Karoo, on the Bushveld complex and uh, on the Fentersdorp uh, large igneous province, but not so much on the Umkondo. So I'd like to, to sort of go through the Umkondo lip today and, um, and present some new geochemical data, in particular some new radiogenic isotope data, which allows us to constrain some of the mantle sources for this lip. And this work I've been doing for the last couple of years with uh, Lou Ashwell, with Kula Carney, who's doing his PhD with, with Lou and myself on the Fentersdorp lip, and he gave a talk last year to this group. And then also Linda as well has been assisting with the isotope analyses at FITS and also Tony Martin, who's uh, based in Zimbabwe and helped us out during field work in that region. So um, just to sort of come up front here and just share my key findings before I go through the, uh, the details. Um, so I'm gonna argue that the Mkondo province is mostly derived from a sub-lithospheric mantle source. And I'll show trace element and radiogenic isotope data that suggests that this sublithospheric mantle source was heterogeneous. And I'll, I'll suggest that we can detect depleted mantle and enriched mantle-like sources in the um, Mkondo lip. Then I'll show that the Mkondo magmas were contaminated by Archean granite gneiss basement rocks during their emplacement into the uh, continental crust. And then Ultimately, a sort of boring conclusion, but I think an important conclusion, which have, has implications for the nature of Proterozoic magmatism in Southern Africa, is that the Mkondo province is very, very similar in terms of its mantle source compositions and geochemical evolution to the Karoo Large Igneous province, which has been well studied and well characterized. So just um, to start with a Quick introduction. So we're all familiar with continental flood basalt provinces. Uh, this is a diagram, a block diagram from Richard Ernst's book, um, basically just depicting the sort of typical manifestation of a large igneous province and placed into the continental crust. So we have a magma reservoir, in this case, partial melting of either a sphenospheric mantle or a lithospheric mantle and then the transfer of these melts um, for a series of dikes into the upper parts of the continental crust. We may have an expression at the surface of a radial dike swarm. Uh, some people like to use these for, for mainly two reasons. One, to kind of find the plume impingement center, if you're a fan of mantle plumes, and then alternatively to try to trace these radial dikes across different continents and then reconstruct paleogeographic um, configurations of continents at the, at the Earth's surface. Um, most of these continental flood basalts have extensive silt complexes um, associated with them. These are emplaced, basically magmas which are injected into weaknesses in sedimentary basins, uh, maybe fed by um, fault-guided dike swarms. And then 
some of this magma may end up at the surface and erupt through some of these dikes as fissure eruptions to form extensive flood basalt sequences as well at the surface. So that's sort of the typical framework that we that we have in the continental flood basalt system, which is in place in a rapid uh, in a short period of geological time and, and huge magmas, um, huge volumes of magmas in place. And then in terms of isotope geochemistry, um, so this is a diagram showing um, the neodymium 143-144 ratio versus 87-86 strontium. And this is actually work from Hoffman in the 90s. Uh, basically, ocean island basalts were pretty well characterized isotopically. These were explored because it was inferred that the magmas feeding these um, ocean island basalts are not contaminated by continental crust, so they provide sort of a probe into mantle compositions. And ultimately, what the, the recognition from this work was that there are different sources recognized in ocean island basalt volcanism. There's this high mu in red, there's this EM2 in yellow, and then in orange is EM1. So various different um, heterogeneity preserved in the Earth's mantle, which is then tapped when that mantle melts, and these products come up to the surface, and we can kind of um, we have this probe or window into the, what the composition of the mantle is. And there's an arrow here just pointing down towards more enriched um, compositions in the continental crust, more radiogenic in terms of strontium and less radiogenic in terms of neodymium. Um, and many continental flood basalts fall on the tra tra trajectory towards this pole down here uh, because they do interact with continental um, material. And I've just put this slide in just because I think it, it kind of follows on quite nicely from Gillian's uh, two talks and, and the next talk coming up. But th this sort of heterogeneity, this chemical heterogeneity that's recorded in the in flood basalt provinces kind of has broad implications for the behavior of mass transfer from the interior of the earth, possibly from the core mantle boundary up to the surface and then material from the surface down towards uh, down into the mantle and maybe to the base of the mantle. So I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but they're basically a series of models in Hoffman's paper characterizing the composition of ocean island basalts. Uh, in the top left here, we have sort of this layered sort of mantle where we have a primitive lower mantle, which is convecting, and then a depleted upper mantle, which is the source for mid-ocean ridge basalts. This is depleted because uh, material has been taken out of this incompatible trace element material has been taken out to form the continents in the early earth. And then we may have recycling of oceanic lithosphere at subduction zones. And in this case here, this, this material only goes down to this sort of phase transition at 660 here between the upper mantle and the lower mantle. And in this idea that the plume is coming from the base, from possibly this low velocity zone at the base of the lower mantle, and this jet of hot rock comes up and then induces um, partial melting of, of um, entrained primitive material, but also depleted mantle material in the formation of ocean island basalts. And that's kind of what's shown in each of these models here, but in, there's, there's slightly different variations going on. And in this case here, the subducted oceanic lithosphere may be going all the way down to the core mantle boundary and with some sort of slab graveyard. And this provides some of the heterogeneous Chemical, uh, chemically heterogeneous material, which is then recycled by mantle plumes from the core mantle boundary. And this material is brought back up. Um, and, and yeah, and, and there's, there's ideas here that some of this recycling doesn't go down into the lower mantle, but then when plumes come up, possibly emanating from deep in the lower mantle or just from this phase transition, they pick up some of this recycled material at the base of the depleted upper mantle. So whatever your preferred sort of hypothesis is for the origin of these continental flood basalts, there seems to be isotopic evidence for this kind of recycling of oceanic lithosphere and the combination of this with depleted upper mantle in terms of contributing melts to continental flood basalts. And there's sort of an ongoing debate, really, um, while we're still doing research on this stuff, um, as to what the mantle sources are to continental flood basalts. And this is summarized here in this diagram from Lou's paper last year in the South African Journal of Geology, basically showing all the different options we have for the origin of uh, flood basalt provinces. So Lou would say, and I mostly agree with him, that much of the material, the basaltic material which forms these provinces comes from the sublithospheric mantle. Um, there are others uh, from 
back in the early 90s and to more recently that suggests that the lithospheric mantle has a major contribution to the um, origin of these flood basalt provinces. But if you dig in and, and sort of the details of these papers, you'll see there's, there's still an argument that material is also coming from more depleted mantle and, and the sphenospheric mantle as well. So I think there's a bit of a spectrum going on here rather than extreme ideas. So I think that the reality is that there's a contribution from both the lithosphere and the crust, and there's a just handful of papers just mentioned here, but there's many more. These are ones I've probably just enjoyed reading, but um, there is evidence in the chemistry of these flood basalt provinces that lithosphere and crust are influencing the compositions of these, um, of these basalts. So whatever the model, there's evidence of uh, a crustal reservoir, some enriched reservoir, which is influencing the composition of the um, flood basalts that are produced. So just to sort of sum up this, this introduction into continental flood basalts, they are controversial and there's a series of questions I'm just going to lay out here, which I will partly get into when I show some of the data for the Mkondo large igneous province. So firstly, are they initiated by mantle plumes? Um, certainly, I think there's some kind of thermal anomaly that needs to take place in the mantle to induce melting and the production of all the basaltic material. What is the composition of these mantle sources? And is this mantle source either in the sphenosphere or in the lithosphere? Is it heterogeneous chemically? And can we detect that? Um, what role does the continental crust play in the geochemical evolution of continental flood basalts? And it's really important to kind of quantify this and to characterize the nature of this process before we can say something intelligent about what the composition of the mantle source is. Uh, a very important question in terms of ore deposits and economic ore deposits and economic geology is what is the relationship between flood basalt provinces and nickel copper PGE deposits? Are sort of particular source compositions in the mantle important for the generation of um, uh, deposits which are enriched in these types of chalcophile and, and siderophile elements? Or is the lithosphere possibly playing a role in sort of preconditioning? Uh, sulfides enriched in these elements, which are then uh, sort of get into the, the basalts in these in these flood basalt provinces before being placed into the crust. And then also there's a question about uh, how they influence, how continental flood basalt provinces influence the global climate. And I think some would say that there's certainly a link between major climatic events and large igneous provinces, and there's some that would go further and say that these have a big impact in terms of uh, driving um, sort of uh, major global climate change events. So moving into the sort of main thrust of this talk, the Mkondo Large Igneous Province. Um, so in Southern Africa, the, there's a fantastic sort of basaltic laboratory in which we can study um, four spatially overlapping, possibly more, uh, overlapping um, continental flood basalt provinces. So on this diagram here of Southern Africa, uh, we can see uh, the oldest of these large igneous provinces is the Fentersdorp um, large igneous province, but really I think we should just call this the Fentersdorp supergroup, and there's probably a couple, um, possibly three, um, magmatic, major magmatic events in this supergroup. Uh, there's the Klipper Wiersberg large igneous province, which recently has been well age constrained, or relatively well age constrained by Gumsley and worked on by Kulakani uh, for his PhD. And that seems to be at about 2.8 and is mostly characterized by Kamartiites and Kamartiatic basalts. And then there's a couple of young events. You've got the Plattberg uh, group, which is sort of more binodal in composition, and then the overlying Allen Ridge um, uh, formation as well, which seems to be uh, partly Kamartiatic. So I think there's, there's, there's actually a few continental flood basalt provinces preserved in a short window of geological time here in the Fentastorp supergroup. And then we move to the um, from the Neoarchean into the Paleoproterozoic and the Bushveld complex, which is pretty enigmatic globally. Um, and this seems to be characterized by basalts, which sort of didn't want to erupt and, and got confined to a, a major sill um, in the crust. And of course, this is famous for its um, quite dramatic and exceptional examples of igneous layering and huge metal endowment in terms of platinum group elements chromium and also vanadium. 
Uh, and then we've got the Mkondo lip in the Mesoproterozoic, um, which is pretty well extensive, almost as extensive as the Karoo-Logignus province. And recently there's been some age dates of some dikes up here, uh, published in Southern Angola, just near the Kunene complex, um, which uh, have Mkondo ages. So this, this yellow area may well extend up to Southern Angola. Um, and then, of course, the youngest one is the Karoo logic in this province, which is Jurassic in age and has been fairly well studied um, and well characterized geochemically. So this is a great natural laboratory with which we can study the sort of dynamics of mantle melting and, and, and mantle geochemistry um, from the Archean to the Phanerozoic. And there's plenty of lessons from the well characterized Karoo province that we can take in terms of uh, building models for the uh, geochemistry and the evolution of the Mkondo lip. So the Karoo, it's characterized by extensive silt complexes all across South Africa and also um, piles of flood basalts. Um, Cox in 1980, Keith Cox basically um, subdivide the geochemistry into high and low titanium suites. The low titanium suites are by far the most abundant type of basalt in the province. And this subdivision into high and low titanium suites has been uh, kind of well uh, applied to other uh, large igneous provinces globally. There's evidence that the mantle sources to the Karoo lip were heterogeneous with both pyroxenitic and periditic mantle source compositions detected. There's also is um, stable isotope evidence from oxygen isotopes that um, there are enriched mantle sources in the Karoo province, but this was mostly work done, I believe, on high titanium pickrites, which are not necessarily characteristic of the, the, the greater volume of flood basalts in the Karoo province. And then most recently in Lou's paper in, in SAJG, he kind of showed that all of the low titanium um, basaltic uh, magmas in the Karoo logic in this province are basically coming from a depleted to enriched mantle source up here, this star, this parent basalt here, and this array, these black dots, which are all of the low titanium basalts, fall on a, a pretty clear AFC mixing array between the parent Karoo basalt and proterozoic granites, in this case, uh, Namaqua, Natal, um, crustal rocks. And this can be modeled quite easily with just you know, less than 10% crustal contamination. So Lou would argue, and I kind of agree with him that much of the um, isotopic diversity that we see in the Karoo basalts can be explained by assimilation fractional crystallization processes. I'm kind of going to argue that, that the Mkondo shows quite similar shortly. So there's a real lack of isotopic data for the rest of these continental flood basalts across Southern Africa. This is a diagram just showing age uh, from old on the right to young on the left. And then this is the epsilon neodymium value. Uh, shown at that particular time. And the Karoo, you can see there's a huge spread of data. There's 570 or so, probably more, um, combined strontium neodymium isotopic analyses of the Karoo. And there's a huge spectrum of, of um, or huge range of epsilon neodymium compositions. Now, if we go back further in time into the mesoproterozoic and to the Umkondo, prior to the onset of my study on the Umkondo, there was only about 18 combined strontium and neodymium um, isotopic measurements for the entire Uncondo province. Uh, but there's hints here that this, there's a spread of, of isotopic data comparable to what we see in the Karoo province. The Bushveld, um, perhaps surprisingly, given it's so well studied and in terms of magma chamber dynamics and the formation of its ore deposits, it has very few isotopic data. And this is something that uh, Busa Siwe, uh, who's on this call, is currently working on with myself and Lou at Vitz for her PhD, is basically trying to get more strontium neodymium and hafnium isotope data for the Bushveld using our clean labs and instruments here at Vitz. And then further back in time, Fentersdorp, at the time of the publication of this paper by Lou, there was only about 29 strontium neodymium combined isotopic measurements for Fentersdorp, but we can now push that probably up to about 90, possibly 100, because of Kulakani's work on the Fenters Dorp for the last few years, and some of his papers should be out um, in the coming year or so. Uh, so getting into the Mkondo lip, this is a, 
a map showing the distribution of large igneous provinces between 1 GA and 1.5 GA. This is from Ernst's book on, on large igneous provinces. And what you can see here is that the Mkondo lip is distributed across southern Africa. There's also uh, some, some of this outcropping in Antarctica here when the Kalahari Craton was all adjoined um, together in, in the Mesoproterozoic. Some have suggested, including Richard Hansen, that the Kiwanaran um, basalts in the mid-continental rift here in central North America are sort of related to the Mkondo uh, province. And then there's a bunch of other occurrences around the same, which have the same ages. And recently these Mahodi dikes have been studied that are here in India. And these have also been, been correlated to the Omkondo province of Southern Africa. Uh, but I'm a bit cautious about making these connections because in terms of the chemistry of these dikes, they're not necessarily related to the main volume of Omkondo magnetism here in Southern Africa, about 1.1 um, uh, GA. So just zooming in a little bit into Southern Africa, this is a map from Hansen's paper where he um, provided some precise age dates for zircon and badleyite grains from intrusions across the Mkondo lip. And this map shows South Africa basically adjoined to Antarctica here and sort of um, pulling together the Kalahari craton in, in the Mesoproterozoic. And there's some pretty good exposures of the Mkondo province across this region. Um, there's the Fred of Fort Sills. Um, this um, is a combination of uh, a couple of intrusions, one called Anna's Rust Sill and another called Barnard's Cop uh, Sill, uh, but collectively I just call them Fred of Fort Sills. And then there's the uh, Palape Sills in eastern Botswana over here. There's the Waterberg Sills, which possibly is the sort of largest extent of, of Mkondo Sills in this whole region. Um, there's the Omkondo Sills. This is considered to be the type section over here in, in Eastern Zimbabwe. This is where we visited to collect some new samples uh, just a few years ago. Uh, there's some lavas in on the other side of the border here from Zimbabwe into, into Western Mozambique, um, a few hundred meters or so of, of lava material related to the Omkondo province. Um, and then there's the Timbavati sil Sills, uh, which are well exposed in the Kruger National Park in the northeastern part of South Africa. And these were uh, studied partly um, by John on the call here uh, in the 80s. And I think you called them the, the Shengi or Shengi uh, Gabros. Um, and then there's also the uh, there's also lavas and sills on Antarctica over here as well, which have been sort of recently studied and, and well characterized and linked to the Mkondo province. And as I've mentioned, there's, there's good precise age dates here for intrusions all across uh, the Omkondo lip, uh, showing that almost all of these basalts were generated in a geologically short period of time of, a, of about 4 million years or so. And then just a few more um, things going on here in the Omkondo province. So uh, there's a couple of layered complexes. Uh, the, the Zade complex is, a, is about a third of the size of the Rustenburg layered suite of the Bushveld. Uh, so this is hugely interesting in terms of nickel PGE exploration. It's entirely subsurface in central Botswana. It's only been intersected uh, with drill core. Um, and there's a couple of bimodal sequences as well. They slight, have slightly younger ages than the main Mkondo basalts, but these may be related in some way uh, to regional magnetism in the Mkondo province. And then I've put these separately over here, the Salpensburg sills and the Middleburg sills. There's a couple of basins here uh, in northeastern South Africa uh, where these sills occur. Uh, but the, uh, there's a bit of caution here about how much of this belongs to the Mkondo province because there's some age data that suggests that some of these sills are paleoproterozoic in age, maybe up to 1.8, 1.9 GA. So uh, there may well be a, another lip event around that time, which has, has not been as well characterized. And then just a list here of various dike swarms, which have been studied uh, by de Kock at UJ and, and others. And some of these uh, in Zimbabwe, the Kamativi, Garuve and Mutari dikes around Zimbabwe have been, some of these have been precisely age dated and they give indistingu indistinguishable ages to these ages for Mkondo sills. So there seems to be some dikes which are related to the Mkondo province across this region. 
So just to sort of sum up some key points about the Mkondo province, it's temporally well constrained um, within this age range here, about 4 million years, the majority of these basalts were produced. It's present across Southern Africa and Antarctica, across the um, Kalahari Craton. The Fredefort sills appear to be on Craton, so the rest of the material is sort of distributed around the margins of the Kalahari Craton. Its extent is comparable to that of the Karoo and also the Etendeka provinces. So this is uh, very similar in terms of size uh, and volume to uh, the more recent um, Phanerozoic content of subbasalt provinces. It's dominated by sills, uh, which were emplaced into Paleoproterozoic sedimentary sequences and also Archean granite gneisses of the basement. There are very few lavas preserved in the Omkondo lip. Either they didn't erupt. I've seen similar in the, in the Franklin lip in Canadian Arctic. There's not too much flood basalt material. It's mostly manifest as sills. So simply, the lots of the magmas may have been trapped in, in the crust and were in place in the crust and didn't erupt. Alternatively, they are a billion years old. So there may have been quite extensive erosion of the flood basalts related to Omkondo magmatism. And there are radial dike swarms as well, some of which have been precisely age dated, but I would just urge a bit of caution in terms of making too many links uh, between the radial dike swarms and the main sill complexes because of the geochemistry, which I'll show in a moment. So many of the samples that we used in this study to collect new isotopic data for the Omkondo province were um, supplied uh, by Richard Hansen and Dean Bullen. Um, they very kindly answered uh, Lou and I's calls um, in 2018 or 2019. They sent us lots of powders of samples that they collected in previous years, which had been analyzed for major and trace elements. That saved us the task of driving around South Africa and, and collecting a whole bunch of new samples. The only place we couldn't locate samples for uh, was Eastern Zimbabwe, the type section of the Omkondo sills. So we, we actually hunted around for Hugh Alsop's samples at Vitz for a couple of weeks, hoping they might be stored somewhere, but we couldn't locate them. And fortunately, Lou had some backing from uh, the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust at this time. So we used some money and we decided to fly out to Eastern Zimbabwe in 2019 to collect some new samples of the Mkondo sills there. And here's a photo of the team. I'm behind the camera, but here's Lou taking a break. Um, here's Kulakane holding the sledgehammer. And this was our guide, Tony Martin, in the field uh, for a couple of weeks in Eastern Zimbabwe. And he, he fetched us at Harare Airport. Um, and, and I gave him a geological map and lots of locations of places I wanted to visit to collect samples. And Tony was fantastic and got us to every locality we wanted to get to for the 12 or so days that we, we, we were visiting. This is a, a sort of typical outcrop of an Omkondo sill. Um, Pretty massive dolerytic gabroic rock um, and uh, pretty fresh as well for, for something which is mesoprotozoic in age. This is sort of a typical outcrop, really. There's quite a lot of vegetation here. And I think some of these sills, um, and looking at some of the geological reports from the mapping done in the 60s in this region, um, these sills are up to 200 and 400 meter in thickness. So it's very difficult to find good exposures of uh, contacts, chilled margins with, with some of these country rocks in the Mkondo supergroup. But th this is kind of a good thing for isotopic work, to be honest. You don't want to be too close to the margins of the sills because you get elemental exchange by diffusion between the contacts. So we, we took good fresh pieces of, of, of sort of hard dolerytic gabbro from, from many of the sort of centers of these Mkondo sills. Um, some of these sills, we, we couldn't see too many contacts with the country rock, but we did find internal chilled margins. There's one in here somewhere. Uh, so these sills are, are composite in nature. So multiple magma pulses sort of using the same sort of weakness and, and sort of jacking up the roof and then growing these sills uh, incrementally. Um, we did try to find some of the basaltic lavas which have been reported in uh, this region, this is the Lower Sabi region, just to the west of the Chimani Mani Mountains in eastern Zimbabwe, and this is a, this is kind of as good as it got really in terms of of, of lava material. Uh, there's, there's mostly clastic rocks here, but there was a few bits of float which was basaltic and anodoidal in texture, uh, which may well be some 
uh, remnant of a more extensive flood basalt sequence. Uh, and here's Lou just um, picking up a, one of our samples here. And, and just to mention, we actually visited this region only a, about six months after Cyclone Edai had, had wreaked havoc um, to the people in this region and devastated the infrastructure and, and the roads there. And fortunately, by the time we arrived in September, uh, many of the roads had been cleared, but there were still remnants of, of some of the damage. And this is just one of the rock falls, uh, quite dramatic amount of material had been transported from the hills down these um, steep uh, river valleys. So it made field work partly, um, partly challenging uh, because of these, all this damage. So getting into the, the geochemistry of the Umkondo Large Igneous Province. So this is a, a TAS diagram on the y-axis here. We've got total alkalis, sodium plus potassium. On the x-axis down here, we've got SiO2. Uh, this gray dashed line here is just from Irvine and, and Baragar, basically um, deline delineating the difference between subalkaline and alkaline basalts. And most of the Uncondo sills. So we've collected all of the data from the literature, and this includes all of our new samples, about 50 or so from Eastern Zimbabwe. And all of these basalts are all of these Uncondo sills are basalts to basaltic andesites in composition. I've highlighted the Fredefort sills, these red stars. This is quite important in terms of tracking what the original mantle source composition was. That's why they're highlighted as these red stars here. And you can see that the dikes um, are these. Uh, crosses here, these black crosses, and they kind of scatter all around and amongst the basaltic field um, and up into uh, the tracky basaltic fields as well into the more alkali uh, areas of this diagram. And the lavas and the bimodal volcanics are mostly alkaline in composition. Some of these lavas may have just been um, contaminated uh, hydrothermally later, uh, adding alkali elements to, to these rocks. But generally, the, that, the conclusion here is that most of these Uncondo cells are just basaltic in composition. Uh, there's a green line here that shows the liquid line of descent of one of our sort of deemed um, uh, or putative uh, parental basaltic compositions. And this is the evolution compositionally of that. There's a couple of, of gray dots here. These are uh, more evolved pegmatitic segregations from some of the Waterberg cells. And essentially, this, this green line shows that fractional crystallization can produce some of these internal uh, segregations, these evolved segregations in the cells. So uh, this on the left here, this is another TAS diagram. This shows all of the Karoo data, and it's a pretty similar story. Uh, most of the Karoo is made up of these basalts and basaltic andesites. Um, in this white box here, this is the average uh, composition of the Lesotho basalts. Well, essentially, there's, there's almost 8,000 measurements for the for the Karoo province, and, and that dominantly in these black dots here, basaltic and composite composition. So this is by far the biggest sort of component, it seems, of the Karoo lip. And on the right here, this is a diagram showing the cerium euterbium ratio. So basically, um, how enriched we are in light rare earth elements over heavy rare earth elements with titanium. And titanium is often used as a way of subdividing um, continental flood basalts into two separate suites, either a high titanium suite or a low titanium suite. The Karoo province um, shows this quite nicely. The cutoff is usually around two weight percent titanium. And you can see in this yellow field here, the Karoo covers a quite large range. Most of the high titanium Karoo basalts also have elevated cerium euterbium ratios as well. Uh, here, all of the Umkondo data are plotted. Uh, including the dikes and the Fredifort sills down here. Most of the Umkondo is low titanium in composition. There's very few uh, examples of high titanium magma suites in the Umkondo. And if they are present, then they are typically confined to the, the radial dike swarms around, around this region. And, and just to note as well that the low titanium basalts um, in the Umkondo lip have pretty high cerium euterbium ratios compared to the uh, compared to the Karoo province. Most of the basalts have slow, slightly lower cerium euterbium ratios, sort of down here. The bulk of the low titanium basalts would be here for the for the Karoo province. And I'll explain later that this higher cerium euterbium ratio in the Umkondo basalts is because of uh, contamination by Archean crust. So I plotted up 
the low titanium basalts and the high titanium basalts uh, for the Mkondo pro province on the map here of Southern Africa. So on the right, this is from Lou's paper. So there's a lot more Karoo data, uh, over 5,000 points are plotted on this diagram. The cutoff here is about 2.5 weight percent titanium. And essentially what we see is that low titanium basalts are in blue here, distributed across a wide area. And then the, the high titanium basalts are kind of restricted to this region up here near uh, Crook's Corner, um, basically uh, possibly indicating some sort of axes of a, of, a, of a triple junction, of a rift. And this is actually where the inferred plume impingement center here. And most of these high, high titanium basalts we think are essentially uh, partial melts of the lithosphere or very highly contaminated uh, asphenospheric melts contaminated by the lithosphere, but they're all kind of confined to this region here. I tried to see if we could see similar in the Omkondo province. We have far less data, only about 700 points or so for the Omkondo lip. And I actually have to lower the cutoff for high titanium basalts at about 1.2 because there are so few of the sort of true um, high titanium basalts in the Omkondo province. But essentially, uh, the conclusion here is that we don't really see the same sort of distribution of high titanium uh, basalts in the Omkondo province, but we do see the skirting of the low titanium basalts around the margins of the Capval craton and the Zimbabwe craton up here, just sort of depicting where, where the magmas sort of came through, but no clear segregation like we see with the, with, of the high and low titanium basalts that we see in the Karoo province. Um, these are Harker diagrams, um, so MGO on, on the x-axis down here, this is aluminium on this side, this is iron total on this side here. All of the Mkondo is basically plotted on these diagrams, and essentially the conclusion here is that uh, the, the, the spread and major element compositions in these Mkondo sills can simply be explained by low pressure fractional crystallization of gabroic assemblages. So essentially we're, we're taking out olivine plagioclase and pyroxene from these samples, uh, nothing out of the ordinary, and to, to produce the distribution of compositions that we now see. There's some models here done in melts of different, what we deem to be parental basalts to the province, all run at one kilobar and, and low water contents, and uh, fairly oxygenated magma uh, as well, QFM buffer plus one. And these are plotted on here, and it just shows that these models um, basically just show the evolution of the liquid composition and, and most of the, the cells track these, these lines. So we can, we can explain the evolution of the composition simply by low pressure fractional crystallization. Um, I'm, I was interested in what the primary magma compositions could be to the Omkondo lip. So many of those basalts which are now preserved in the, in the cells and in the dikes and the few lavas are are fairly evolved in terms of MGO content. So they're not true primary magmas. So there's this nice algorithm uh, by Hertzberg and Asimo called Primalt, where we can basically plug in uh, one of our more uh, magnesium uh, parental basalts. And then they the model basically just adds olivine. So it assumes that olivine is the only phase to have fractionated from the parent basalts. And you add the olivine until you get to a composition which is an equilibrium uh, with olivine in the mantle. And for most models, we have to add basically about 20% um, olivine to the sample to, to, to get a primary melt composition. Uh, this is just one example here from the Borg Massivit sills in Antarctica. Uh, but essentially about 20% olivine addition to the parent basalt leads to a primary melt composition, which is uh, usually between 18 and 20% MGO. Uh, according to the IUGS classification, uh, this would be a, a Kamatiite. So the, the primary magmas to the Omkondo province are essentially Kamatiitic to Kamatiitic basalts. And this model predicts that we need about 40% partial melting of a garnet for the type mantle source. But I'll actually show on the next slide that most of the mantle sources were shallower and were spinel lurts lights in composition. Um, so there is evidence that the, the, the major source for the mantle source to the Mkondo province was, was shallow. It was mainly spinel lertzolite. This is a plot here showing Sumerian meturbium. So this is the ratio of or the enrichment of middle rare earth elements to heavy rare earth elements. 
versus um, light red earth elements to middle red earth elements on the x-axis down here. So basically anything plotting high up here is probably from a deeper source region, which had garnet in the residue. And you can see down here that well, there's, a, there's a couple of mod, uh, modal um, melting paths plotted on here. So this is melting of, of Karoo garnet lertzolites. This is melting of Spinel uh, lertzolites. And all of the Umkondo data are plotting with pretty low Sumerian muturbium ratios down here and are pretty consistent with melting of, of shallow mantle material, um, which is spinel that's light in composition. Uh, you can actually estimate uh, the, the range of depths. Typically, the bulk of the basalts are coming from about 40 to 50 kilometers depth, and there's pretty limited evidence of deeper melting uh, over 70 kilometers or so. So many of those samples are, um, are the dikes, the Umkondo dikes. Uh, which uh, do seem to record um, evidence of, of deeper melting, but we don't really see this much in the sills, um, which are by far the more sort of dominant component of the Nkondo province. There's also evidence that this source was heterogeneous in composition. Um, just have a drink of water here. So, on this diagram here, we've got this, this ratio um, of zinc to iron. Basically, higher uh, zinc iron ratios are kind of indicative of um, more ecclegitic um, mantle or paroxynitic mantle sources, and lower ratios are more indicative of peridotitic sources. And what we see is that the majority of the uh, subalkaline low titanium basalts of the Nkondo province mostly fall in this peridotite source field. And there's some extension here into the pyroxenite field. So there's an evident, evidence that there's a combination of sources, both peridotitic in composition and also pyroxenitic in composition. The Karoo province is shown in the background here in this yellow diagram, and that also shows a pretty similar uh, distribution. And there's a bunch of other trace element proxies which I've used, which kind of support this idea that there's, a, there's some kind of enriched mantle component, some sort of pyroxenitic component, in the mantle source to the Umkondo province. So I won't go through some of the details of these points, but essentially the argument is that the, the mantle source is, is heterogeneous in composition. So just getting into the isotope data, this is the, the, the main new thing that we bring to the study of the Umkondo lip. So this is just a reminder of how little data, isotopic data there were previously for the Umkondo province. So this is initial strontium plotted against epsilon neodymium. So in the background here, slightly faded, shows all of the uh, black dots, the basalts of the Karoo province, which Lou modeled with an AFC array. And prior to the collection of our data, we now have about almost 50 or so new um, Umkondo strontium neodymium and hafnium isotope measurements. But prior to that, we had pretty few, only about 15 or so measurements. So we couldn't really make any kind of um, clear assessment of what the mantle sources were and what the compositional evolution of this province was. So this is, um, these are our new data, um, new strontium and neodymium data plotted on this diagram here. So epsilon neodymium on this axis, initial strontium ratio, and both are age corrected to the crystallization age of the Mkondo lip. And there's, a, there's a, quite a bit to pick apart here, but Effectively, what we see, we, 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 have, we have depleted mantle compositions at about 1.1 here. Roughly, the positions of enriched mantle about here. EM2 would be slightly higher around here. And the Fredefort sills are pretty important because they're sort of preserving uh, a sort of more radiogenic and uh, neodymium isotopic composition and a uh, less radiogenic strontium isotopic composition. So they're sort of indicative of what the closer to what the mantle source composition would have been, somewhere around enriched mantle and inching towards depleted mantle in this direction up here. And then there's this array, which we think is comparable to the Karoo large igneous province in terms of its how it was formed. We think this is an AFC array. And essentially what we have is um, the Waterberg sills, the Palapi sills and the Mkondo sills, all showing this uh, trend towards more enriched isotopic compositions down towards uh, continental crust. The Timbavati sills are kind of intermediate between uh, Fredefort and the rest of the sills and the sedimentary basins over here. Interestingly, these red stars and uh, orange diamonds, Timbavati and Fredefort, are both emplaced into 
Archean granites, whereas most of these samples down here are placed into sedimentary uh, successions. Um, in the background here, in this gray field, this is the Omkondo dike array, and you can see there's a pretty large spread. So the dikes, um, which have been analyzed in parts for strontium neodymium isotopes, um, show the largest range of isotopic composition of this entire province. So if, if, if all of these dikes really are Omkondo in age and are related to the main flood basalt event, then there's a pretty diverse spread of isotopic compositions uh, here. I'm just going to pick up the pace slightly because I'm conscious of time. I'm, I'm running over. Um, so we've also got hafnium isotope data. This is the first hafnium isotope data produced for the Omkondo lip. Uh, so on this diagram here, we can we can see the mantle array as this dotted line. Most of the Omkondo lip falls on this mantle array. However, some samples are kind of falling slightly below it, suggesting that there's some decoupling between the hafnium and neodymium isotopic compositions. And some of these samples may be um, uh, sort of giving us a hint that they are contaminated by material from the lithospheric mantle, essentially. But, but most of these samples are plotting on this array between a depleted mantle or enriched mantle source and something which is very, very old and very enriched, uh, Archean crust down here. So. Once we started plotting this data up, we we start we started to explore what kind of contaminant could could produce this uh, array of neodymium and hafnium isotope data for the Omkondo province, and we think essentially that this is uh, Archean Johannesburg Dome uh, TTGs. Um, so this is a diagram showing epsilon neodymium at 1.1 plotted against this ratio, cerium over ytterbium. So our enrichment in light over heavy rare earth elements. And there's a, there's a pretty good co-variation here between epsilon and neodymium and this ratio. So as this ratio increases, we get down to more unradiogenic neodymium isotopic compositions. And the uh, if you um, calculate the isotopic composition of the Johannesburg um, TTGs at 1.1, then you get values of about minus 30 epsilon neodymium and this range in cerium ytterbium. And we think most of these Omkondo basalts have interacted with with this crustal contaminant here, and uh, which has produced this, this spread of data. Um, so we always try to sort of quantify how much assimilation there's been. Um, so these are models basically just showing the uh, two component mixing between uh, Archean basement granite, so Johannesburg Dome, plus our starting Omkondo basaltic composition uh, represented by the Fredefort sills. These are pretty crude um, mixing equations in, in the sense that it's bulk mixing. The reality is that you probably partially melt the contaminant and then add that partial melt to the basalt. But basically, we, we can quantify bulk mixing to be no greater than 20%. So about 20% assimilation of Archean basement rocks can produce the spread of isotopic data in the Omkondo province. And this sample is actually quite good, N130. Uh, this is a, a leucosome, so it's kind of representative maybe of a partial melt of Johannesburg Dome brace, uh, granite basement rocks. And I've, a few months ago, just before the um, chaos of fieldwork and teaching kicked in for me, uh, I started to play around with this um, magma chamber simulator. It's been published in a, a couple of papers by Borson and, and Heinemann. But essentially, this is a more robust way of quantifying the amount of crustal assimilation into a basaltic magma. And I've just played around with a couple of models. Um, this, I need to sort of um, work on this a bit more in the coming uh, months. But what this model suggests is that there's very small amounts of assimilation and less than 5% assimilation of this Archean granite crust um, can produce the distribution of a condo data in, in, in terms of isotopic composition. So I think this is a pretty reasonable and realistic amount of, of contamination to explain uh, the chemical evolution of the Omkondo province. So just sort of bring this towards a conclusion. So we think that the petrogenetic evolution of the Omkondo province is very similar to the Karoo province, where we have AFC processes, uh, basically controlling the isotopic distribution of the basalts in this diagram. And I think this model is emerging. This is from Newman's paper and JPET. 
uh, basically just describing the evolution of the Karoo province, where we have stage one with melting of the sphenospheric mantle, interaction with metasomatized lithospheric mantle, and then then placement into uh, the basement rocks, uh, where much of the contamination happens before final emplacement into shallower level um, sill complexes hosted in sedimentary basins up here. So I think ultimately, um, the Omkondo province is pretty similar to the Karoo province in terms of this uh, sequence of events. And this is just summarized here into some bullet points. So uh, we have the generation of primary commartiotic uh, magmas, which originated in a heterogeneous sublithospheric mantle source with both depleted mantle and, um, and rich mantle oib-like signatures uh, preserved in that mantle. Assimilation of some lithospheric mantle material, but this is very difficult to quantify. And I think I need to, to, to investigate this a bit further to try to strip out the clear evidence of lithospheric contamination in these basalts. Uh, there was the intrusion of uh, modified primary magmas into the crust, um, possibly ponding at the Moho. There's a lack of ultramafic cumulates in this whole province, so many of these may have ponded. Uh, these magmas may have ponded mo moho and much of the ultramafic material is down there. And then there's AFC pr processes predominating with less than 5% assimilation of Archean basalts when these magmas are emplaced into the, into the mid-crust. Uh, the age data for the Timbavati sills from Hansen's work basically shows that the Timbavati sills are some of the oldest in the province. So these probably came in first. And some of these cells show nice uh, olivine and orthopyroxene modal layering. And then finally, we have the transfer of modified parental melts into the upper crust to form extensive sill complexes and sedimentary basins. And there's evidence of pretty limited crustal contamination at the site of emplacement into the into these sedimentary successions. Most of the contamination is happening in the deeper crust. Uh, so th this is probably the same story for the contemporaneous flood basalts, if they did exist. And then the um, Fredefort magmas, interestingly, which are pointing towards our kind of mantle source composition, they're in place on Craton, uh, rather than being at the margins of the Kalahari Craton. So there's a few outstanding questions, um, just, just quickly. So uh, we don't know where the ultramafic cumulates are in this province. Um, maybe they're trapped in the deep crust. Maybe they got delaminated and recycled. Uh, interestingly, there's no known nickel copper PGE sulfide mineralization associated with the Omkondo province and the Zarde complex in Botswana could be a great site to investigate that further. Were there extensive flood basalts? Is there a true high titanium suite of basalts in the Omkondo lip? And there's actually quite few radiogenic isotopic data for the Archean basement. So there's only about 10 or 12 samples or so that I could find in the literature on these rocks. Uh, so we could probably constrain the compositions of these basement rocks better before we start building models for uh, quantifying crustal contamination. And, and that's it. Um, so just wanna say thank you to Dean Bullen at University of Portsmouth in the UK, uh, to Richard Hansen at Texas Christian University in the US for supplying many of the powders that we analyzed for isotopes here at WITS. I'd like to thank Marlin at WITS for doing most of the major and trace element processing of our samples from Zimbabwe during a difficult time in 2020. Thanks to Henriette and Marlina at uh, UJ for um, analyzing all of our samples and then multi collected there. And also thanks to Grant Bybee as well for many conversations about isotopes over. Uh, lots of coffee, and I'll just leave you with this team photo here, which includes Linda, who's um, away at the moment. And if anyone has any questions and wants to discuss the Omkondo lip with me, then my email address is uh, down here. So I'll leave it there, John, and hand back to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Ben. That was a, a super presentation and lot, lots of good diagrams and lots of good food for thought. Okay. Um, I'm just, just, to, just to remind you, my power might drop off in about a minute's time. Yeah. Uh, so just give me a couple of minutes to log back on uh, once the generators kick in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we get, we're getting used to that. Right. Who, who wants who wants to kick off the questions? And um, and and I guess we must acknowledge Gillian for um, your earlier training, Ben. She obviously did a good job. Uh, you know, maybe just a bit more tactful than Gillian. 
I think she's dropped off probably too much to your chemistry. Yeah, absolutely. No <laughs> way. I'm <laughs> proud of you, Ben. Proud of you. Okay. All right. Do you want to kick off, Gillian? Do you want to start? You, you've muted um, yourself. Do you need a plume to explain the um, condo? <laughs> That's a question I've been thinking a lot about in the days leading up to this talk after after listening to your presentations. I mean, look, I, I kind of like the idea of plumes. There's, there's definitely a consensus around there that, that plumes you know, are, are an essential role in producing these magmas. I, you know, to sit on the fence, to answer the question, but to sit on the fence, I would say that there certainly needs to be some kind of thermal anomaly in the mantle that leads to partial melting and the production of all of this basalt in a short period of time. So if, if you show me convincing evidence of another process than a, than a plume that can do that, then I'm, I'm kind of open to, to new ideas. So um, uh, just to respond to that, um, if it's modeled quantitatively, it's shown that, it's possible to show that um, it's not possible to uh, produce magma at the rate it's erupted for a case of flood basalts that erupt in just one or a very few number of millions of years. In order to produce basalt at that rate, you cannot do it with reasonable temperatures. Mm. You have to produce it over a longer period of time and then erupt it quickly. So yeah. uh, it, it, it's very common to hear people say, you know, only plumes can explain these vast quantities erupted so quickly. But in fact, if you do the calculations, plumes cannot explain that. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned after your first talk or during the first talk that there's this long lived reservoir of melt in the mantle, which and it, it's just a case of some process higher up teasing that melt out, some process, some geodynamic process forcing that melt to come out of the mantle. Um, I, I, so I, I, was, I was thinking about that a lot after, after your first talk. I mean, are you, are you suggest, suggesting that there's, this, that there's partial melt constantly in the upper mantle, um, which periodically is tapped at the surface? Um, th this is not my own work. Um, this is uh, work done by uh, an American seismologist called Silva. Uh, I'm sadly deceased now, and uh, he showed using uh, uh, xenoliths that the mantle lithosphere was intact before and after the eruption of some Southern African lips. And he showed that um, if, if upwelling material stalled at the base of thick lithosphere, it could not produce the volumes of melts observed um, in the eruptions and certainly not over a short period of time. So he concluded that uh, the inevitable conclusion was that the melt must have formed over a period longer than it took to erupt, i.e. you have a reservoir which was tapped. Mm. But what about if, if that melting zone is not central beneath the sort of deepest roots of the lithosphere, but is more kind of marginal. I mean, mo most of the geochemistry of these basalts in the Umkondo lip, uh, they seem to be coming from shallower melt sources, spinel lertzolites, um, rather than this sort of the base of the cat valve craton. So I think, you know, there's, there's, there's material coming up the sides of the craton, which is dominantly melting. And if you add those volumes in, can you then produce the amount of basalt you need in that short period of time? Well, uh, you've just formulated a problem that should be looked at. Um, I, I would have thought if you produced, uh, if you boosted the volume greatly by um, melting the continental mantle lithosphere and the continental crust, then presumably you'd see that geochemically. Hmm. So then it's a question of um, how much of the lip comes from continental lithosphere and, and how much comes from sub-lithospheric sub mantle. And uh, of course, if you find that uh, a huge percentage of it comes from the continental lithosphere, then you've got even less requirement for a plume, haven't you? Yeah, but I, I think the evidence of subcontinental lithospheric melts, um, that evidence is quite limited. I think it's, the, it's these high titanium 
and incompatible rich basalts, which are volumetrically much smaller compared to the more dominant low titanium basalts. And I kind of agree with many of Lou's arguments in his paper last year about how over time you can't keep melting the subcontinental lithospheric mantle to produce these basalts. You wouldn't, and effectively wouldn't exist and you wouldn't have diamonds uh, in the Mesozoic. So I, I kind of think the, the role of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle is quite limited. Um, but it, it can be detected in some of these basalts in, in terms of its isotopic composition. But it's not the major source of the basalts. So that, that might be an interesting thing to look at, the uh, relative volumes that came from different regions. Um, of course, e even if there's a lot of material coming from the asthenospheric mantle, you know, it, it, that's got absolutely nothing to do with the plume. You know, I'm sorry to bang on about this, but um, that's absolutely no evidence that it's come up from the core mantle boundary. That's just fantasy. You know, that's much, much more than can be said. Yeah, I, I must say, I do, I do find that idea quite attractive. I don't know why, but I've always liked it. Uh, I think that's why oh. people maybe uh, appeals to people. Um, but I, I think you made an interesting point again after your first talk about um, what role um, fragments of continental crust play in in the you know below sort of ocean island basalts because there's evidence that in some of the lavas erupted in ocean island basalts that there's Archean age zircons and protozoic zircons in the basalts so many of these enriched isotopic signatures which are characterized in these ocean island basalts could really just be formed by contamination of um of continental crust at higher levels rather than it, rather than it sort of being representative of of, of heterogeneous mantle um, something me and Lou discussed because because Lou found um, Archean age zircons in Mauritian basalts and, and sort of argues that there's pieces of of plates um, below which are Archean age. Right. So um, you know this is the direction in which uh, I'm trying to uh, shepherd um, my my colleagues and my group. Um, just to touch upon your comment that um, the plume hypothesis is very appealing and, and uh, um, a lot of people um, are firmly uh, in favor of it. That again is absolutely no, you know, that's so totally unscientific. You know, I, I mean, there, there are vast numbers of people who are either atheists, Buddhists, um, Islamic, you know, Christian, and <laughs> obviously they can't all be right, but there's still large numbers of them. So, you know, this is another argument, you know, in addition to often hearing, oh, only plumes can explain these huge volumes. I also hear lots of people believe in plumes and that's absolutely completely not an argument. It means nothing. You know, it's not an argument and uh, I'm, I'm not getting at you, Ben, or trying to be aggressive, but um, just because a whole lot of people believe in something, it doesn't make it right. We're scientists, uh, not politicians. No, sure. I, I see that viewpoint, and I, I like it. Okay, let's get let's get some other um, input here. Steve Haggerty, are you going to talk to us this morning, or, or still hiding away, or having your coffee? Um, and Andy, do you want to come in and um, say anything from a Karoo perspective? Uh, I just like to say to Ben how much I enjoyed the talk. I thought it was some really good data and a very interesting interpretation. As far as the comparisons with the Karoo, I think you've made very good comparisons with the low titanium Karoo. Um, and I think that the work that Lou did and that you and I are continuing um, raises the whole question. We have to re-examine to what extent the low titanium Karoo can in fact be um, attributed to crustal contamination. Um, it was rejected by uh, a lot of the early workers, John amongst them, and uh, particularly uh, Gunny Marsh and Hugh Eels. Uh, but I think it needs to be revisited. And I'd also like to see that low titanium Peru uh, put through the um, magma chamber simulator and see what we come up with there. Uh, but I think that, that needs to be re-examined and uh, in the light of the work that's gone on now. Hmm. Good stuff. And, and Steve Haggerty, I mean, look at it from a Kimberlite perspective and something we've talked about, you know, protecting our diamonds, um, you know, right. from way back in the Archean. <clears throat> well, I'd like to, uh, thanks, John. Um, I'd like to come back uh, to Gillian's uh, rather aggressive comments, if I might, uh, Gillian, with all due respect. <clears throat> There's an interesting correlation, whether you like it or not, 
uh, between uh, lip intrusions and the behavior of the Earth's magnetic field. And that is that when Kimberlites were intruded at, largely in the Mesozoic, and then also at 1.1 uh, giga anna, is that the Earth's magnetic field was an atypical behavior. And the, <clears throat> the notion is that um, disrupt, excuse me, disruption of the D double prime layer on, uh, on a sphere um, is that this is one of the reasons that um, we have synchroneity of Kimberlites all over the Earth at about the same time. And you can't do that either by uh, 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 just uh, decompression or by subduction. That just isn't possible. But the really interesting feature is that this correlation, which applies to the Mkonga, for example, and all of the, the Karoo, Ettendecker, and the, and the Mesozoic, is that the Earth's magnetic field remain in a single direction, which is atypical, namely it didn't go back and forth, uh, which is the more typical between normal and reverse, remained in one direction. And the, so what the, the model then is, that uh, liberation and disruption of the D double prime layer inevitably has to affect the circulation dynamics in the outer core, which is due, which is where the Earth's magnetic field is generated. So there is this geophysical, geochemical diamond relation. And that is that one of the points we made, uh, and coming back to Ben's talk, excellent talk, Ben, thank you is that uh, it's, evident, it's evident now from these uh, super deep diamonds. And as Hat Yoda always used to tell us, there's only three ways of melting rocks. And the point we made now with regard to deep diamonds, the, the source, the heat source has to be deeper than the deepest diamonds. Okay, so now we have diamonds uh, with uh, very exotic mineral inclusions that teach us that these have to come from the lower mantle. Therefore, the heat source has to be somewhere in the lower mantle, and the furnace at the core is the obvious source. So that's, that's my comment. So as far as I'm concerned, Ben is correct. It is plume-related, absolutely no question. And, uh, with, and once again, with regard to Silver's model, you know, I, I, knew, I knew him and, um, from the geophysical laboratory, but you know, that just doesn't doesn't tap. I mean, you just can't have these huge volumes of, of magma sitting there over some period in excess of 5, 10, 15 million years. That sure is heaven. We wouldn't have diamonds, as John, I think, was hinting at, if that was the case. There's no, there's no way that we could have Mesozoic diamonds with this huge volume of, of material that was then sucked up uh, at some later period of time. So those are my comments. Thanks, John. Thanks, Stephen. At least we've got another another view and in, in, insight. Thanks very much. And 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 one thing I would say, when and I also agree with Ben, and um, I think Andy's probably you know of a similar view, is is like Ben says, um, so much of this um, thermal perturbation or activity and and emplacement actually tends to be around the margins of the craton. I, I think we. You know, we, we, we forget that these lava flows can go miles and miles. They once covered, or the crew covered most of the craton, but most of the actual intrusive activity and the, the big dolerite dike swarms were around the edge or, or sort of in these pull apart triple bait, um, triple junction areas. So that's, that's my bit. Um, Neil, do you, you got any comment there? And Lou? I'll, I'll, I'll add a question for Jillian. Um, if, you, if you are entertaining the idea that there is melt continuously or semi-continuously um, somewhere below the, below the lithosphere, wouldn't we, able, wouldn't we be able to see that seismically? If it's there today, there should be a big attenuation of S-waves. Uh, yes, there should. And, uh, you know, I have sort of urged colleagues, not very uh, strongly maybe from time to time to um, actually focus their efforts on looking for them. This is something that uh, 
seismology could do. But uh, as I'll be describing tomorrow, you know, an awful lot of seismology is focused on trying to find plume tails in the core, in, in the lower mantle, which uh, we can't do because uh, theoretically they're too small to see. So yes, I, I agree with you 100%, Lou. So it'd be very valuable to get some students busy doing that. I need to interject, I've got to go. So I want to thank Ben for a fine talk and I'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Thanks, James. Thanks, Thanks very so much. much. Thanks for checking in on, on your travels. Thank you. Okay. Other comments, Neil? You're very quiet today, although you're a, a gold buff. <clears throat> yeah, the one thing I can say is I, I'm no expert in this field. Um, a, a slightly different question. Ben, you talked about, and it's been known for a while, these at least four lips over 2 billion years in Southern Africa. Is, is that typical of every con subcontinent? Is it unique to Southern Africa or is it a bit, bit in between? Yeah, good question. I, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, it seems to be unique. I can't immediately think of um, other Archean cratons around the globe right now, which have overlapping lips. Uh, just thinking of the uh, Pilbara, the Superior, um, I don't know. Does anyone else have any any suggestions there? But to me, it seems pretty pretty unique to the the Kalahari and, and the Cap Val that you have these sort of constant generation over geological time of, of large swathes of basalt. Um, because I don't think I, mean, I really answered your question. If we no, you've suggested it might be unique, and others might say you're right or wrong. I don't know, but, but I guess the next thing is that. Uh, what does that mean? What does it mean about Southern Africa? And I have no yeah. idea where this is leading. I think I think um, some would say maybe Tron Torshvik and Lou can correct me if he wants to. They would say that there's a there's a sort of anomaly at depth in the deep mantle. You know, there's one sort of beneath Africa, Southern Africa, and there's one in the Pacific. Um, and the, these are sort of long lasting uh, anomalies at the base of the mantle from which these plumes or whatever are, are they're coming off those those low velocity zones. Um, and I think that's potentially one explanation for why there's this concentration of, of flood basalts in, in South Africa. Uh, but maybe Lou has another opinion there. I, I don't have another opinion. I, <laughs> I, I would wonder then, um... I, I don't think that would limit it to Southern Africa. That, that should should happen elsewhere. I guess you know it, it's Tron's idea that uh, that plumes come off not from these low velocity shear wave provinces, but off the edges of them, and so uh, those are the plume generation zones, according to him and Kevin Burke. Um, but I, I don't, I can't really see why that would focus all of the plumes in Southern Africa. It is a, it is a, it is a, a mystery, and, a, and mm. a good one to try to figure out. Okay, another another problem for your list, Gillian. <clears throat> right. Well, Any... um, I, I discussed with Trond on one occasion. I mean, he he pointed out that um, Iceland, for example, um, does not lie over um, this. Uh, LLSVP in the lower mantle that's under Africa. And um, uh, he said that was a problem for him, very gracious of him. Uh, <laughs> but then I noticed the paper came out a couple of years later, actually extending the LLSVP. It's got kind of long arm reaching up so that it just underlay Iceland. So now Iceland is declared to overlie the Southern African LLSVP. Yeah, he, he uh... I think he also admits that the Columbia River, if it is indeed a large igneous province, uh, is is also one that doesn't lie anywhere near an LLSVP. Okay. But he, then, I, I think he would he would claim great victory in saying that eighty percent of them are are located right above the edges of the LLSVPs. Uh, what, one thing that makes me somewhat uncomfortable with this is. Um, uh, first, well, two things actually. Um, first is that um, 
we cannot get paleo longitude, obviously, you know, from, from geomagnetism. So uh, this is just allowed to be whatever it wants in order to make the best possible fit, which I find suspicious. And um, that's the other thing I was going to mention. Um, oh, the other thing is that uh, um, some colleagues of mine um, looked statistically, uh, we had a group in the mathematics department here who, who looked statistically to see what the correlation of, uh, of uh, hotspots, unquote, with um, spreading plate boundaries, current spreading plate boundaries is, and the correlation was equally good. I don't think we can profitably um, make any progress on this question without, uh, without the, the contribution of Trond and his friends. I, I'm not able to, uh, to do statistics. Uh, one, one person from that group, I can't remember who it was, um, but their contribution to this paper that was published uh, pointing out this correlation with, uh, with Ocean Ridges was to email uh, the lead author on that work and uh, threatened to come to his poster at the AGU and quote sort him out and um, I was considering bringing my son in as a bodyguard because uh, I, I think that individual must have emailed uh, whilst intoxicated or otherwise impassioned <laughs> I'm actually afraid for his safety <laughs> Do you think there's going to be a fist fight at the uh, poster session? I did, I think, yeah. <laughs> my, my son's a great hulking rugby playing type, and I was thinking of putting him in a DJ and having him stand by the poster and protect the authors. <laughs> Very good. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we haven't got there yet. Um, I guess let's start wrapping up. Um, uh, any more, any last comments, Stephen? Um, no, I'm fine. Then. Look forward to Julian's uh, uh, paper tomorrow. Yep. Right. Thanks, John. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Um, so I'm going to switch off the the recording now, and. Um,